Thanks everyone for coming. Uh, we had a great working web conference today. If you couldn't make it uh, this year, I encourage you to come next. We had a great slate of speakers and a uh, wonderful speaker dinner last night. Um, I was lucky enough to be at PyCon and see uh, the last iteration of this talk and a lot of us had our socks blown off. So I decided it'd be a great thing to do since uh, Jacob was gonna be in Philly for the conference anyway. Uh, Jacob is director of security at Heroku and has been involved, in, involved with Django since its early days. Um, I won't steal your thunder on this one. <laughs> but uh, this is a really amazing talk and uh, got a standing ovation at PyCon. So I consider myself lucky to be seeing it again and trying to make him blush. So without further ado, please help me in welcoming Jacob Kaplan-Moss. With that intro, I am sure to disappoint you. So I apologize in advance. Uh, so yes, I gave this talk at PyCon. Um, this is sort of a V2. Um, and it's gonna be a little, it's gonna be a little interesting giving this a second time because um, a lot of this, this talk came about, I, I thought of this talk, I got asked to keynote at PyCon and it was, it was staggering. It was an amazing honor. I've been going to PyCon for over 10 years. I've been involved in planning it and organizing it. The, the Python community is tremendously important to me and PyCon is its biggest, its biggest stage. I've done a lot of public speaking and uh, nothing, nothing means as much to me as as that talk, so so I got asked to go. I got asked to speak, uh, and I went and went for a run, which is what I do when I, I need to think, and uh, and that's where the seed of this talk, my feelings at the time. Um, so I you know I, I opened this talk at PyCon by thanking people for uh, for having me, um, and thank you for having me. Um, you know. Speaking at PyCon was the highlight of my um, was the highlight of my professional career, and that's not that's not hyperbole. Um, done, I've done a lot of things in in in, in tech in, in my career that I'm that I'm proud of, um, but uh, you know PyCon PyCon is special. You know, um, in, in 2005, Adrian demoed uh, what at the time we called the CMS, the set of tools we were building at the newspaper in Kansas um, at PyCon. And it was a five minute lightning talk. And after that talk, someone said, hey, you should open source that. We did and it became Django and we just celebrated Django's 10th anniversary. Um, uh, and it's used all around the world by companies so, so big that I can hardly conceive of them. Um, you know, I watched PyCon grow from 300 people to 3000. Um, I watched the community explode with new people and new faces and growing diversity. You know, really, PyCon is really special to me. I'm getting to speak there. And then afterwards, hearing that the talk resonated with so many people and being invited to, to speak again, I mean, it's really been um, incredibly successful. And so um, the thing is, when, when, when I got asked to speak there um, and when I got up on the stage there and when I got all this great feedback and when I got asked to repeat the talk, what keeps going through my head is, um, is that I, I don't deserve this. Um, you know, what I'm feeling mostly about this success is insecurity, um, not pride. Well, it is pride. I'm happy and I'm excited and I'm very proud, but I'm also feeling like I don't deserve it much. And, you know, there's this voice that's telling me, you know, you don't deserve this, you know, you don't belong in this company. You know, I, I spoke at PyCon, the other keynote speakers, um, Catherine Bracey is the uh, director of community outreach, I think for Code for America, you know, like literally making democracy better. And I'm some dude working for a platform company that's part of Salesforce, like what? Um, you know, from the moment I was invited to speak, um, uh, I had this idea of, of, of this voice in my head telling me I didn't deserve that. And I just realized I need sound. Can I make that work or are we too late for that? Should I just do the microphone? Sorry about that, y'all. I think it should just be ready to go when it's plugged in. Well, let's, let's see. Let's, let's see what see. happens. <laughs> so this voice is what uh, Jay Smooth calls the little hater. Go in here. 
ill doctrine is back in effect. I haven't done a video in a long time. There's been a few reasons for that. Reason number one, somehow both my cameras managed to stop working. Reason number two, I was busy with my first ever trip to Los Angeles for this big web video event called the Winnie's. Shout out to everybody I met over there. And the other reason I haven't been doing videos for a while is basically I don't always feel like I'm cut out to do this stuff. I'm sure there are some people who wake up every day feeling confident that the entire world wants to look at their face and listen to them talk, but I'm not one of those people. When I'm in the groove of getting work done and I feel like I'm making a connection with you guys out there and my ideas are resonating with you, it feels natural to keep showing up and maintain that connection. But if I go too long without putting work in and it feels like that connection is broken, there's a little voice inside my head that starts playing tricks on me and trying to convince me that the connection was never really there. And I think this is true for all creative people that we each have a little hater that lives inside our heads and tries to set up traps for us. Jay is awesome. He's he's just awesome. You should check out everything that he's that he's uh he's ever recorded. <laughs> um, and so when I hear him talk about how he doesn't feel like he deserves his success, I go, "What are you talking about? You're you're amazing. You 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 know everything you say resonates deeply. I watch your videos over and over again. I use." I use an excuse to stick them into the talks that I give. Like, how can you possibly? And then I remember, oh, you know, I get that same that same voice. You know, my my little hater tells me that I don't deserve my success. And the thing that's really insidious about this little hateful voice is that there's always like a little part of that voice that's kind of right. Like, there's some truth to it, right? My little hater isn't telling me that, um, you know, you're actually really short. You know, it's, that doesn't, you know, that's not actually a thing. I, you know, I know how tall I am. It's easy to judge. No, it's like he's telling me something that there's it's a little kernel of truth that, you know, it isn't that I don't do work that I'm proud of. And it isn't that I'm not happy with my career and the success that I've had. But the things that I'm proud of probably aren't the things that you're thinking of, right? The things that you are assuming that I am proud of, the things that you think that I would be proud of probably aren't things that I did. So, so I'm often introduced, I thank Tim for not introducing me as the inventor of Django, but I'm often introduced in, in that way. And some of you all probably think that's, that's who I am. Um, sometimes I'm introduced as the co-creator of Django, which is a little more accurate, but it's also kind of not true. The, the actual truth is that like, I'm a dude who started working there like a year after the people who created it created it which is a much more messy title and a lot less interesting and a lot more accurate. Um, you know, people think of me as this creator and, and you also probably assume that because I'm somehow associated with Django and because I created it, which I didn't, but you assume that I did, you assume that I'm a great programmer, that I'm really good at writing software. I'm not. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm not. I and mean, this is not false modesty. Like I know the things that I'm good at and I'll brag about them, I'll pat myself on the back about them if you want me to, but look, like, programming is not one of them. I'm, I'm pretty average. I'm okay, I can get the job done, but I'm pretty average. Let's put a pin in that. I wanna talk about Ann Trayson. This is Ann Trayson. Um, she's probably the most accomplished ultra runner of, of all time. So ultra running is uh, running distances over a marathon, longer than 26 miles. Um, most of these races are on trails. Most involve highly technical terrain, um, lots of climbing. Common distances are 50K, it's about 31 miles, 50 miles, and 100 miles. Yes, people run 100 miles. Yes, they run all of it. Uh, one of the oldest 100 milers in the country actually is here in, uh, here in Pennsylvania and, and pretty, uh, pretty popular. Um, so Anne won the Western States 100. Uh, that's a 100-mile race that goes from Squaw Valley uh, in Tahoe to uh, uh, Auburn, uh, near where I live, actually. She won this race 100 times, uh, 100 times, 14 times, I'm sorry. <laughs> it's been a long day. She won this race 14 times, which is, which is amazing, right? I mean, that, that's it's an amazingly long uh, career, uh, spanning a couple of decades. Um, she set dozens of course records in the 80s and 90s, many of which stand today. Her course record at Western State stood for... 10 years, 15 years before it was finally overturned. Um, uh, and this is it's an incredibly tough, tough race. 
1984, Anne set the course record at the Leadville 100. So the Leadville 100 takes place and it starts in Leadville, Colorado. It runs out from the town of Leadville, uh, which it, its town is at 10,000 feet. Uh, most of the race takes place above 10,000 feet. It runs out, it runs over Hope Pass, which crests over 13,000 feet, down the other side, and then back up and over and back the way you came another 50 miles. Um, since then, only a handful of women have come within an hour of her record. It's not like some people have come close to breaking her record. No one's even come within like thinking about it. Um, it's never been close. She still holds a, a dozen or so records many, many years later as, as times have been falling and falling and falling throughout the sport. It's hard to overestimate how dominant, you know, how dominant she was in her sport. For nearly two decades, she won every race she entered, two decades. Um, so I am now an ultra runner as well. I finished a 50K, uh, which means that I actually get to wear that same, uh, that same uh, uh, tag, that same label that she, that she wears. Now, of course, I'm not anywhere in her league. Um, I was 535th out of about 1,000 runners, pretty average. Um, and I've got the numbers to prove it. Um, the course that I ran and held the course record at until very recently, by the way. Um, so the thing about running that's kind of cool and kind of fun is that we can objectively measure the difference in skills between me and her. Um, we could argue about how to measure that distance, right? I mean, we have to account for some physical differences between men and women in, in sport. Um, you know, we have to account for the fact that the course that I ran on this 50K is slightly different from the course that she ran. Um, you know, we could compare time, we can compare pace, you know, we'd have to account for difficulty, but, but we can like, we have numbers, we, we can do this, right? We can come up with a technique and we can talk about it. Um, there's a website, Ultra Sign Up, that most of these mountain and ultra runners use to sign up uh, for races, and they have something they call a runner score, um, which is basically, so they, they, um, they take the time of the winner, and they take the difference between your time and their time and basically give you a percentage score based on that. So I'm like, you know, I, I am on average like 40% slower than the winner of the races that I enter, right? So, um, you know, you can see that I'm like a little better than average. I finish a little higher than, than average in most races that I enter, but, but not by much. And actually, if you break it down by distance, I start looking worse the longer the races. Um, Anne's is a 99.6%, which means that basically when she enters races, she wins them. Um, so we can, we can quantify the difference between us and we can look at, um, all runners and it, and it's not surprising that there's someone who's that much better than me, right? Like we know sort of from studying, from studying statistics, we know that most measurements of performance break down looking something like this. And if we graph all of the times for all of the races across the history of, of ultra sign up, we're going to get a shape that looks a lot like this, right? Some people are very, very good. Some people are very, very bad. Most people are in the middle. As pattern so common, we call it normal. <laughs> we almost consider a law of nature, right? It's natural. It's normal. It's the way, the way most things are. And the reason is that nearly any time we measure skill across any discipline, across you know, physical or, or mental, across any population, we tend to get shapes that look a lot like this. So how does this apply to programming? So some of you probably still didn't believe me when I set, when I set that up, right? But why? We know that skill tends to follow normal distribution. We know this intuitively. Like None of you were surprised when I talked about running following a normal distribution, but you may have been surprised that I'm kind of crappy at programming. And so why did you think that, right? You know, we know that most skill follows this pattern and you don't know very much about me. So if you had to guess where I fell in a, in a normal distribution, you know, why did you guess that I'm under this part? What, what led you to think that? We don't know how to measure programming, like at all, in any way. Like what are, what are our metrics? What do we measure? Lines of code? <laughs> story points? What's a story? You know, we, we don't, we have, 
we have this vision of ourselves as working in this very data-driven and analytical business, but we actually know almost nothing about how to measure what we do. Um, we make up stories. We do, we do what humans do when we don't have data, even when we do sometimes, and we make up stories. Um, and the stories we make up about skill, especially in tech, are very simple. This person rocks, that person sucks. <laughs> we fall into this implicit assumption that skill in programming is distributed like this. Most people are either really good or really bad. I mean, and think about it. Like when you talk about people you work with, you're like, oh yeah, she's an amazing program, one of the best people I've ever worked with. Oh, pff, that guy, he's not worth the chair he sits in. Very rarely do we say, oh yeah, I've worked with Frank for many years. He's, he's pretty good, he's fine. He does a good job. He's, you know, shows up, he does his work, he goes home. It's great. <laughs> and because we only have two narratives available to us, because we only have a narrative of brilliance and a narrow narrative of terribleness, you say, well, okay, he's, he works, you know, he invented Django. I only have two buckets. Must be the rock star bucket. But we know, again, that if we could measure programming, if we could actually figure out how to measure writing code, we'd almost definitely get something like this. I can't prove that because we don't know how to do it. But if we did figure out how to do it and we got a shape that looked different from this, that would be a massive surprise. That would be you know, an incredibly weird and strange finding. The reason is simple. Most people are average at most things. This assumption that programming skill falls into this weird bimodal distribution is pernicious. It's throughout our industry, but it is a myth. And this talent myth sets up a world where you can't program unless you fall under the skinny part of the curve, where we don't consider a vast amount of work as like real programming, unless it fits some preconceived notion of, of brilliance. This isn't, couldn't be further from the truth. Most people are average at most things, and that's completely fine. So what does this myth do to us? What does it do to our industry? What does it do to ourselves? So we have a massive employment problem in technology. The Bureau of Labor Statistics estimates that there's a one and a half million job shortfall in the tech industry by 2020. Now that's very good for most of us here because it's gonna keep driving our salaries up and that's great. But think about, think about the people who aren't getting that, those jobs, right? It's not because of lack of talent because again, there isn't that much talent. Sorry, y'all. Um, <laughs> so what we're doing is we're keeping people out of what could be very, very good jobs. Each of those million job, million and a half job gap represents someone that we might be able to take from a bad, from a bad job to, let's face it, a pretty cushy one. Um, you know, we sometimes talk about the, the pipeline problem, this problem of getting more people into tech. Um, and the talent myth stands in the way here. Um, it prevents people who might otherwise be interested from getting into technology. Because if we believe that programming skill is di distributed bimodally, um, we'll come to this belief that programming ability is innate, right? You're either you're born with it. You're, you're people, you, you were somehow born knowing how to program or, or you weren't, right? And so if somebody doesn't fit into that image of, of the great developer, we just assume that they're not good at it because they, then they'll never be good at it. If the only options are that you're amazing or terrible, we'll believe that you have to be passionate about programming. You have to you know, think about it all the time. You have to like, go home and, and you know, study new things in your spare time. It has to be more than a job, more than a career. Um, you need to be spending you know, all of your waking time thinking about software. It doesn't put you know, families with children in a very good situation if you have to be learning new skills in your off time because that's what a real programmer does, does it? We don't believe these things, this passion, this, this innate talent about other things. The last year, half a million people ran marathons. Um, were all of them innate runners? 
No. In fact, most of them were rather bad about them. Most of them, like me, did it pretty slowly. Um, and nor do we believe that you have to be passionate about running. In fact, there's like a whole cottage industry of people complaining about how much they hate running. <laughs> I went for a run this morning. It sucked. <laughs> Running a marathon is hard. It takes years of training, miles and hours of time, and requires serious commitment and focus. So what's harder, running a marathon or sitting in front of a laptop and writing some JavaScript? So why is it that we tell ourselves that anybody can do this, but only a few people can do that? So a few years ago, uh, I attended um, GIS Day at KU. Do you do GIS Day here at UPenn? A lot of universities have um, GIS, Geographic Information Systems. OK, I'm giving you a homework assignment. Find when your next GIS Day is and go to it. Um, geographers are amazing. And so, OK, so um, in the afternoon at, at our GIS Day at, at, at Kansas University, um, graduating students give presentations about the projects that they worked on as part of their, as part of their uh, senior work. So these are fantastic, like technically detailed talks on really interesting original research. Uh, any one of those talks could easily be presented here. Most of these people are using Python. Most of them are using Linux. Most of them are using uh, Postgres, um, PostGIS, open source software. Um, there's a massive, massive overlap between the work that these students do and the work that we do as, as Python programmers, right? Like this, this is, you know, they're doing it in a different domain but they're using many, many of the same tools. So why, aren't, why are there no geographers here? Um, are there no geographers here? We are in an academic place, so there might be a few. No, OK. More likely here than, than almost anywhere else. And yet, like the tool of choice in these communities is Python. So one student gave this really incredible presentation. Um, uh, she, was, she was studying the Kansas River and how it, um, and how it floods and basically doing uh, predictive, predictive flood mapping based on historical rainfalls and the way the river changes over time and also year, yearly trends and, up, and upstream data. Um, and basically like, trying to predict you know, where floods were going to come later in the year. And the tools she used, again, were familiar to most, most Python programmers, Amazon Web Services, Linux, Postgres, Python, Django, et cetera. But the time I was hiring Python developers, and her talk blew me away. Uh, she was light years ahead of anything that I was doing. Um, so I asked her after the talk if she was interested in a job. And she's graduated from universities in the town where I work, Python programmer, you know, perfect. And she said, nah, you know, I, I don't think I can interview. I'm not really a programmer. So she just written thousands of lines of Python to build her own like massively distributed GIS data processing cluster. Like, I can't do that. <laughs> and yet she's not a real programmer. So why is that? We have to start to recognize that programming isn't like one thing. It isn't a passion or a career or even a job. It's writing code is just a skill. And actually, it's not just a skill. It's like dozens of them, hundreds of them. You know, shipping successful software requires all kinds of skills. And remember, we're not in the business of writing code. Nobody is paying you to write Python, right? They're paying you to ship software. Python is like what you use. You know, any, any, any more than a carpenter is being paid to hammer nails, right? Carpenter is being paid to build that house, not to use the hammer, right? And shipping software requires many, many, many skills. Programming, of course, but also writing, communication, design, debugging, under, uh, you have to understand Unicode. Um, <laughs> there are multiple independent skills that you have to have in order to, in order to uh, uh, you know, work for a software company. And you don't have to have all of them, right? Like a successful team is, is this amalgamation of different talents with different kinds of skills. One person is very good at testing. Another person has some great design chops, another person just is really good at communication and documentation and, and collaboration and coordination, and another person is really good at Python, right? And these things come together into a really great cohesive team able to do amazing things, but that the individual programming talent of any one person on the team is really not 
even close to the most important uh, measure, measure of why that team is successful. So like any skills, you know, you can do any of these things professionally, or you can do them occasionally. You can do them full time, or you can do them part time. You can do them as a hobby. You can do them badly, or you can do them well. They're just skills. They're just things. There's no, nothing different about learning to write Python than from learning to run a marathon. You just do it. Do a little bit one day and a little bit more the next day and a little bit more the next day. And over time, running 26 miles goes from being unfathomably, unfathomably impossible to being the first half of the race that you're planning for. <laughs> <laughs> if we embrace the idea that it's good, that it's acceptable to be okay at programming, it's gonna be much less intimidating for newcomers to put their feet in, right? Because we're not gonna tell them they have to be good at it. We're just gonna tell them this is a thing you can do. And hopefully, I will help you. Past these barriers to entry, this talent myth drives even established programmers out of the career. So this part is the one that's difficult to talk about. Um, it's important to acknowledge that anyone who's watched tech closely knows that our industry is filled with sexism and racism and homophobia and many forms of discrimination. And this is complex and it's multifaceted, and it would be wrong to suggest that any particular, that there's any single root cause for the problems that are facing our community. But one of them, one of those facets, is this idea of talent. So in our industry, this talent myth gets recast as the, the, the brilliant asshole, the person who's so brilliant yeah, oh, he's a jerk, but you, you know you got to work with him because he's just so brilliant. Um, and people defend these jerks. You know, the argument is like, well, they're so good at their job that we have to put up with their toxic behavior. But in, in reality, if we know that skill is so, we know that skill is normally distributed. You know, how likely is it that that person is really such a brilliant programmer? Or have they just driven away anyone who might say otherwise? You know, how many brilliant programmers do we have to have to make up for all the other people who simply won't work with that dude? <laughs> <laughs> this is Linus Torvalds, the creator of Linux, <laughs> helping keep this myth alive. <laughs> we sometimes talk about this 10x programmer. And so the most insidious part of this myth is our assumptions of what this brilliant programmer looks like. So when you think of a 10x programmer, what are you thinking of? You're probably thinking of someone like this, like Mark Zuckerberg, a young white dude. We've seen him in the media, on company mastheads, on Charlie Rose, on every... Okay, that's... That's not Mark Zuckerberg. <laughs> That's actually Jesse Eisenberg. He played Mark Zuckerberg <laughs> in a major motion picture about Mark Zuckerberg. So that's Mark Zuckerberg. <laughs> actually, that's not Mark Zuckerberg. That's Andy Samberg on Saturday Night Live. And he's pretending to be Jesse Eisenberg, pretending to be Mark Zuckerberg. <laughs> okay, that's Mark Zuckerberg. I'm fairly sure that that's Mark Zuckerberg. Okay, so trying to be funny and thank you for laughing, but there's a point here, right? This, this young white dude archetype is so ingrained in our heads as, as what a real programmer looks like is we can confuse the real person for the stereotype. We, we don't write, Aaron Sorkin doesn't write a movie about an old black woman programming or a Native American man programming or a Chinese child programming. He writes a movie about a young white dude. And in fact, this image is so ingrained in us, we need three people to play the same archetype. So when we see someone who doesn't fit the stereotype, we assume that they're not a real programmer. You assumed maybe that I was a, a real programmer because I look somewhat like those people, a little too much. Um, 
almost all the women programmers I've talked to have a story about someone assuming that they're not a programmer. At PyCon, I talked to multiple women who were asked that this year who, who they're there with, right? Which guy they're there with. On the other hand, no one ever asked me that. <laughs> no one ever asked me what woman brought me. That has never been a thing that happened. So Shanley writes about this in uh, an essay called 10X Engineer. Um, and she digs into the research and talks about um, where this myth came from. Uh, it's a great essay and a great collection. You should buy the collection. It's really good. Um, spoiler alert. Uh, Shanley finds that the original research was really flawed. Uh, it took place over three days, I think. It's a great way to measure success of a software team. Just watch them for three days. It tells you everything. Um, and in fact, this is a quote uh, there is from Shanley's essay. There is no conclusive body of scientific research to suggest that the 10x engineer is, in fact, a real phenomenon. So I, want to, I need to sort of sidebar here and talk about this essay a little bit. Um, when I first gave this talk at PyCon, I didn't. The slide wasn't there. I didn't talk about this essay. And I should have. It's one of the things that influenced my thinking here. Um, and in fact, a lot of Shanley's work has, has influenced my thinking, both her work and the work that she's published in Model View Culture. It's some of the most uh, incisive and sort of um, uh, clear-headed thinking about technology and the technology industry these days. I should have referenced her book at PyCon, and I didn't, and I'm sorry. You know, I'll try like I'm doing now in the future to acknowledge these sources of inspiration. Um, I'm, you know, I'm talking about this not just because I need to apologize for that mistake, but also because it's really, uh, it's really illustrative. And as much as I, I'm embarrassed by this and don't, I'm uncomfortable talking about it. Um, you know, there's a long history of men taking credit for women's work, and I did that here in a way. Um, I didn't think about Chanley's essay. It didn't, it didn't come up in sort of my research. And so I didn't really, since I wasn't quoting it, I didn't really think about it and it sort of passed. And it's interlinked, right? It's interlinked with what I'm talking about here. For the same reason that you assumed that I'm a good programmer, you might have assumed that this material was entirely original when in fact we're all influenced by what we take in and what we read. And I probably assumed that this work was original and didn't do enough sort of uh, uh, research on other related information. Um, you know, it's really embarrassing, but in giving this talk, you know, I illustrated the very problem that I'm talking about. I internally, I internalized the idea that I'm so brilliant, I came up with all of this on my own without thinking about anything that came before. There are probably other sources besides this one that I, that have influenced what I'm talking about here. And these sorts of assumptions have a real disastrous effect on our industry. Um, so this is some data from the National Center for Women in Technology. Um, we have the most data about women in tech. I suspect that numbers for other marginalized groups in tech would be similar, but they're not nearly as well studied, um, which itself is also part of the problem. Um, women leave the tech industry at twice the rate of men. 40% leave within 10 years compared to 70% of men. And you know there are certainly other causes, right? But imagining how frustrating it must be to be, have people continually assume that you don't know what you're talking about just because you're a woman or just because you're a person of color or just because you're younger or older than the stereotype of a programmer. It's gonna take us a lot of effort to fix text diversity problem. And we're never gonna get there if we can't think of a more nuanced way of thinking about developing software. If we can't start to break things down into their constituent skills, if we can't start to think about many different ways that we might contribute to, to writing software. We have all kinds of runners, sprinters and distance runners and marathoners and ultra mar marathoners, trail and road, professionals and amateurs. And if you go out to your town's weekend 5K, you will see runners of all sizes and all shapes and all abilities all genders, all races. And each one of them is going to have different metrics for success. You know, someone running their first 5K 
might be struggling to finish, and that might be the most meaningful thing they could possibly do just to finish, while the you know high school track star might be trying to you know set a new age group record. And both of those are, we would deem each of those things success. We would call each of those things success. We wouldn't try to balance them against each other. We would let people be successful on their own terms. We have got to find a more nuanced, fair understanding of what software development really is. So another little story. Um, I had a conversation um, at another PyCon many years ago um, with, with this woman, with Lynn Root. Um, Lynn's a programmer. She's founder of the San Francisco chapter of Pi Ladies. Um, she's a PSF board member. Uh, she, run, she is an auctioneer at the charity auction at uh, PyCon, which is one of the best, best parts where I, where I won the tie. And the year before that, Cufflinks. So I have, I'm working on a whole suit over the next you know, few <laughs> PyCons. There was a 26 pound gummy python that the winner paid $800 for on the condition that we cut it up and ate it then and there. It was really disgusting. <laughs> anyway, so I was, uh, at the time, PyLadies was a fairly new force within the Python community, and I was really excited about, about, the, about the energy, about the enthusiasm, and about the diversity that, that PyLadies was bringing into tech. And I said something to Lynn along the lines of, you know, it's just so great to see so many badass women getting into Python. And Lynn said, yeah, I mean, that's great. But we'll know that we've been successful when we have a bunch of average women programmers. Because you know there are a bunch of average male programmers, right? <laughs> the myths that we tell about talent set this really high bar for entry. We have to dismantle those myths. We need to build a community where we recognize that average is pretty great. So please join me and let's be okay at our jobs. <laughs> Thank you. Do I have time for some questions, Tim? We've got nothing but Han Dynasty in front of us. Oh, well then, no. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> yeah, I can take some questions. If anyone's got them. Um, when you have to hire someone, what, what, do you, what do you think is important when you have to hire someone? When I have to hire someone, um, what do I think is important? Or what? I'll answer what I do. Um, so um, Actually, before I answer what I do, uh, there's a couple of uh, blog posts I've read recently by uh, Kate, Kate Houston about, um, about hiring. Um, so I would look up her blog posts. They're, they're really good. She talks about some of, the, some of the criteria and some of the ways that you can sort of set up your hiring pipeline to try to balance for, for biases. Um, so uh, I can't spell. <laughs> um, I, will, I will look it up in a moment for you. Are you a mediocre speller or really? I'm a terrible, terrible speller. <laughs> so, my, fifth grade, my, fifth grade, <laughs> my fifth grade teacher tried to fail me because I was so bad at spelling. <laughs> yeah, that had nothing to do with spelling. That's just one yeah. thing. Yeah. Um, but so hiring. So what we do at Heroku, um, and it's not perfect. I want to be real clear about that. I think it's better, but it has some problems. Um, we, we do what we call a starter project. So we actually have candidates. Um, we interview them very lightly, mostly just to make sure that there's an alignment between what we want someone to do and what they want to do. And once we've sort of established that, yeah, you know, they want to do the thing that we want done, um, we have them work with us for a day or two on a project that closely approximates what we might might actually work at on the thing that we work at. You know, the best predictor of how well you work with someone is how you work with them. Um, and this does have its own problems, right? Not everyone can take a couple days off work to do a starter project. Um, you know, it might be a bad project that we pick. It, it does have its own problems, but it does solve for some of the problems of making snap judgments based on a one hour interview. And it certainly solves the problem of the, the dreadful like Google all day interview about that it requires you to write code on a whiteboard. Oh God, whiteboarding. Um, <laughs> the other thing that, um, the other thing that I that I do uh, personally 
Um, this isn't any sort of company policy, but just a thing that, that I've, I've started doing. Uh, so, so the NFL uh, has something called the Rooney Rule. Um, uh, 20 years, 30 years ago, the NFL had a really big problem with diversity among head coaches. Uh, the majority of players were of color, but the majority of coaches were white. In fact, every coach was white. And um, the, the Rooney family, they own the Pittsburgh Steelers, they um, introduced a rule and got it adopted by the head coaches that in order uh, to hire a new head coach, offensive or defensive coordinator, you have to interview at least one minority candidate. Um, not, not lots, no, no quotas, no preferential hiring practices. You gotta just interview one person who isn't a white dude. And now the majority of, uh, majority, not the majority, I think it's 40% of head coaches in the NFL are black. Um, this seems like a trivial rule, right? It seems so simple, but the fact, it's, it's amazing. When you make an effort to interview candidates who aren't like everyone else, turns out they're just as qualified as the other candidates you're interviewing. So I've tried to do, to do the same. The recruiter that I work with um, knows this and works hard to sort of feed my team um, qualified candidates from across a diverse set of backgrounds. And, um, you know, I've had, I've had some success. So uh, people who were at PyCon uh, told me we were talking about that into it. And I feel like, I feel like I don't agree. Uh, okay. And, this is also something I do. I, I often play devil's advocate. Uh, so um, how about you and I have this discussion one-on-one -on -one later on? Okay, sure. Thanks. Do you want to ask uh, Courtney, sorry? Um, Courtney was going to ask online? Yeah. Oh, yeah. She's watching okay. the screen. Tim, uh, we got another question up there afterwards. Okay, sorry. Courtney uh, used to work with us here at Warden, but it's moved on, unfortunately. Um, she asked, well, jumping off the Rooney Roll thing, uh, do you see that there are more women and people of color coming in, but the hiring rates for women, people of color are staying static? It's a good question. I'm not sure that I have that I have some data on much data on that. I do know that um, when we look at diversity numbers published by uh, companies like Google and Facebook and um, and various other organizations. We've, we have seen the number of uh, women in these organizations increasing over the past few years as they've published those numbers, but we haven't seen the, uh, we haven't seen the number of um, people of color or Hispanic people rising uh, at all. I think somebody recorded, reported that Google, uh, Facebook hired seven black people last year <laughs> out of a few hundred or something. Yeah. Um, three, four hundred. So I do think, uh, and I sort of alluded to this earlier, I think that a lot of our efforts around diversity have been focused on, um, on white women uh, and certainly getting more women into technology is, is important and, um, you know, and we're nowhere near done there, but I do think that there, um, we haven't seen nearly as much effort, um, effort put into other marginalized groups. Um, I don't know about hiring rates. Um, the only numbers I would have would be our internal numbers, and I probably can't talk about those publicly, even if I had them, unfortunately. Fair enough. Question for you on those numbers. Are those numbers for technical personnel, or are they for just overall? Because there's in a company like Facebook, right? You know, probably a third, a third or more of the new hires are not technical people. Right. Yeah. Um, yes. Yeah, so the, the 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 diversity numbers that most companies have been publishing are typically have been broken down into technical and non-technical roles, and typically they've broken them down into uh, leadership versus non-leadership, which is another place to look. Right? Companies will often brag about um, their great diversity numbers, and then you look at their board, and it's not reflected there. So. Um, uh, the, you know, there is some monkey business with the way they report the numbers, but you can usually find at least that level of detail. Um, in those numbers. Uh, when you look at average, is average a relative term? Is that a static term? Have you found over the past 10 years you need to do more to be average? I don't know, do you equate it to running? I, I, the average mile was six minutes okay. 10 years ago and now it's 5.30. So I actually think one of the things that continues to excite me about technology is that I think that, um, I think that we've done one thing we are doing well is continuing to lower the barrier to entry to 
um, to writing more, more, more complex and more complicated things. You, you know, when I think about um, when I think about our motivations behind open sourcing Django, one of the, the big drivers was that you know Django let you do more with less work, right? And it made it made building certain types of things accessible to people who just couldn't do it because they needed to know way more pieces pieces beforehand. I'm really excited about Node, for example, because it makes uh, types of concurrent development that used to be really, really hard and not accessible to average developers. And it pulls those, those hard things down into what I think is accessible to, to more and more people and puts them in a language, JavaScript, it's one of the most accessible languages that we have. So I actually think that on the technology side, we are, we are I don't know if, if we're changing the definition of average, but I think we are building tools that are putting harder and harder things in, within the sphere of what most people can accomplish, while we simultaneously tell them that they can't accomplish that, which is what's particularly annoying. <laughs> this is talk online, you presented here something that's non-threatening to <laughs> present to people and get them to get this. Um, it, this, this talk is online. The talk that I gave at PyCon was recorded and it's on YouTube. Um, this one, I think, is being recorded. I'm not sure. And will also be on YouTube. And will also be on YouTube. <laughs> Creative Commons. So, yeah. Thank you so much. Um, so I was really intrigued by the metaphor that you used of, you know, how people feel when they think about trying to learn to program versus if they decide to, you know, run and that idea like the marathons and sprints and all that sort of stuff. Um, in that light, have you given this talk to an audience that's been primarily non-tech people? And how have they received it? Um, I haven't really given this talk to non-technical people. Um, I have talked about this talk with a bunch of runners, which has been particularly fun. <laughs> um, and, in, and has uh, gotten some of them interested in learning to program. Actually, um, if I can hijack your question, after, this, after I gave the talk at PyCon, I got an email from uh, a friend of Ann Trayson's and ended up getting introduced to her, and she's actually developing her own website um, and has been before. <laughs> right. So basically, TLDR, she can do everything I can do, and I can't do anything that she can do. So. <laughs> um, I would love to give this to a non technical audience. I think it'd be really interesting. I uh, teach at an all women's college, and I, you're absolutely right. Uh, uh, this idea of the imposter syndrome. Uh, all of the students coming in have that. And uh, so I, I'm really glad to hear you, even as a white dude, uh, talking about this. And I hope that more people in the industry really take it to heart and learn something. Thanks a lot. Thank you. I appreciate it. Hey, what do you think is a, a, the phenomenon of like Code Academy and all these sort of uh, boot camp type programs for people who, you know, maybe went to this school and graduated and you know, years later, get the idea that oh, I should I should know how to code. The boot camp thing is really interesting. I haven't really decided where like what I think about that because on the one hand, I think it is doing an incredible job making software more accessible to a lot of people. Um, but on the other hand, it's kind of a it's kind of a wild west. Like there's there's no real there, there's no real standards. Again, we don't know how to measure what we do. So a lot of these programs just sort of throw people in a room for a few weeks and then are like, all right, you're done. And I think that that's unfortunate. I, I worry that that's setting people up for have their first experience be a failure. I don't really know, you know what, to, what to do about it. Um, I think there's a wide variety of people, like boot camp is a huge label now and lots of people are doing it. And I'm sure some of them have figured out really successful models and others probably haven't. Uh, but I just don't know enough about it to know what those models look like. Hi. Um, so you gave a, um, you know, you said we basically need in, in the tech industry, people from different minority groups. But uh, how do you go about doing that? Because this just isn't a tech problem. This is a, this is a, <laughs> this is a corporate problem. This is a world problem. Yeah. What, what are your suggestions on going? You know, other companies actually doing it. It's it's a very hard problem. Um, and I and I would be like 
totally disingenuous if I suggested that I had that I you know knew like an answer or even a, a few good ones. Like I've seen some things that work in some areas. Um, I think you're right that it is a it is a large systemic societal problem, and it's not something to be solved in in one place. Um, I hope that companies focus on. Um, I get annoyed when I see companies focused on on pipeline, on bringing more people in, while they have a really shitty corporate culture. Um, and I'm not the only one to to have recognized this. Um, what's the Julie Pagano has an essay called like the pipeline is full of acid. I think it I think it is. She's got a little cartoon of this pipe with like daggers and acid, and it's it's pretty great. Um, yeah, I mean like we're not gonna like. A lot of a lot of tech, a lot of companies, but especially a lot of tech companies have really toxic cultures. And if we just keep shoveling new people into that meat grinder, like we're not actually solving the problem, right? And so I hope that companies are using. We're starting to get like more scrutiny on this issue now, finally. And I hope that companies are using that scrutiny to examine their own internal culture. Um, and I'm focusing on that, you know, personally. Like, I don't know how to go change Google or Yahoo or Microsoft or whoever, but I do know how to change my company where I work. And I do know how to do things with my team and the teams around me. And so I try to focus, I try to focus on that. I try to focus on building, you know, building inclusive environments, building welcoming environments, changing hiring practices, um, you know, those, those sorts of things to try to build an environment where people are, where people feel safe and welcome and, 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 want, and want to stay. And I don't think that that's adequate, but it is something I know how to do and something that I can do. I thought it was interesting that you approached uh, your talent acquisition person or your recruiter and had to specifically say, <laughs> I would like X. And I think that is a huge problem within the corporate industry is that they are a, um, bonafide gatekeeper in a really nasty way. <laughs> yeah. And I think um, if, I mean, in terms of like, wow, this is a really complex problem and how do we solve it? That could be really one way to, um, you know, this is a red flag. You know, if your companies are using recruiters, they're typically using them in a certain way. Right. You know, it's really funny, right? Like I, it's totally it's totally comfortable for me to send an email to to the recruiter I'm working with and be like, hey, you know, you've been sending me a pool of candidates. I'd like to see more people in the pool who know Splunk, right? Like that's totally not awkward. But if I send, hey, you've been sending me a great pool of candidates, but I'd like to see more people from more people who aren't white guys. Suddenly, like that's a thing, right? And I felt super nervous about bringing it up with with him. And 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 Justin, to his credit, is is a, a great person to work with and has really, you know, thrown himself into presenting a really diverse pool of, of candidates. Um, so I got, you know, I got lucky to work with someone really good here. But yeah, I mean, like, <laughs> yeah, I think the first step is for, you know, those of us who are in hiring positions to, um, you know, to, uh, uh, to, to buck up and, and, and send that email and say, hey, I want to see, I want to see these skills and I want to see these backgrounds. and don't you know? Don't take no for an answer. If you're you know, if you're in a hiring position, you have a, a fairly large amount of power, right? Your company has given you, you know, a lot of, a lot of power, and it's you know, one of the things. Let me get back to your question. One of the things that we can do from within these companies is use the power that our companies give us to move to move those levers. And hiring is a great place to do that. So I was curious if you've ever worked with an OD person, is it you know, organizational development folks who specifically work on culture. And it seems to me like such a perfect opportunity for someone who really knows how to do that in corporate culture about other things that could come into an environment like this. Because um, I think what you said about it starting from the top, that is always where it starts. And so the person at the top is surrounded by lots of white guys, to use your, your phraseology, then you know, people coming in are looking at that and they're going, okay, I guess that's what I need to create. But if you environment where people are having this conversation. I mean, just even you having the conversation here, I think is an amazing thing. Like just this room of people having a conversation about that is already sort of changing things. So I'm just curious if you've ever had that experience, if you've ever worked with anyone. Um, we do have folks at, um, 
at our company that are focused on culture. I haven't heard the term, um, what, OD, what is it again? Well, it's organizational development. Organizational I development, I okay. I have a colleague. Oh, okay. And I'm not pitching this at all. I mean, it's not, my, it's not what I'm doing <laughs> at all. But it's the first time I've ever heard this. She actually, um, um, she changes the culture. Like she, uh -huh. her, in, in, her focus is that they go into organizations and they work on creating a sustainable culture. That's awesome. So if you want, I'd be happy to give you her. I, I would love yeah. to. Um, an, another person that I'll. I don't get any kickbacks. <laughs> hey, even if you do. <laughs> no, but seriously. Yeah. I thought it was so intriguing that she kind of looks at it like it's about um, a sustainable component of your organization. And without that, you know, like what you said, throwing people in the meat grinder is not going to create a better environment. Yeah, I totally agree. I think Frank had a question. Okay. Can I just follow up? I'm sorry. Yeah, I didn't fine. mean to say that it was just talent acquisition people, but that it's the hiring managers too. Right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I like where this whole thing's going, but I think we're seeing, yeah, because I come from technical communication and a lot of startups say, we don't need that, right? We don't need documentation. We don't need to help users. You know, and then they get up to a few, a dot 10 programs where they say, well, we don't need project managers. Yeah, at a certain point, I think, like, I mean, I was in a startup that grew very quickly way back in my career. I remember the first real project manager we hired, and she was just a revelation. Like, gee, we can get all this work done, and we don't have to be here 60 hours a week. <laughs> yeah, we're actually getting more done, and the quality's better, and, it, oh, and you know, we, we have family and lives again. But, and I think, I think you're hitting not just this whole talent, myth, but the whole... That, that a tech company is really a company, and there's a lot of, you know, it's diverse in people, but also in skill sets. We like to like we like to tell ourselves that like tech is different, and like we don't we don't need things like HR, and we don't need like we don't have we don't have managers. We have holacracy circles. Like we we make up all this BS to try to tell ourselves that we're somehow special, and like we're not. We're the new factory workers. Like every company is a software company now. There's nothing special about making software. This is just like another thing that that we do now. And yet we said still we've we've hung on to this idea that we are somehow different and special and we play by different rules and it hasn't really gotten us very well, very far. I think we have time for one more. Yeah, I was just thinking about the talent myth and with like how prevalent it is and historical context being around for decades. I mean, even Fred Brooks is still referencing the like a 10x myth in 1970s and stuff. Like, how do you actually get change on a large scale uh, for something that has much time for this? That's a great. That's a great question to end on. Thank you. Um, I had a conversation with a colleague of mine. Uh, his name is Chris Stolt. He runs this uh, the support team at Heroku, and his hypothesis, and I love it, is that you know we've been telling ourselves these stories about programming for generations and what we need to do is start telling is start telling new stories we need to start telling telling stories of collective success we need to start telling stories about that time when we all really came together and worked a sustainable schedule over six months and shipped the product on time without anybody having to take a late night or a weekend without anybody needing to cut corners when management and, and, and programmers were in alignment and when our customers were really happy with, we need to be telling you know, stories, stories about that, about, about that type of collective success and just you know, get ourselves used to hearing those narratives and celebrating those narratives the way that we you know, have in the past celebrated the, the hacker in the hoodie drinking Mountain Dew. Um, so um, yeah, thank you all very much. I really appreciate it.